Today we are talking about technology in the financial services sector with my guest Louis Vargas. Some of the topics we are going to cover include key factors to consider in order to pick the right technology, how the decision making process works and a short list of common pitfalls that organization faces when implementing new technology and of course much more. So here is our one-on-one interview. I hope you will enjoy it and learn more about technology in the financial services. Hi Louis, welcome to FinCram Agent. Uh, how are you today? Doing well. Sun is uh, finally shining here in Copenhagen, so feeling good. How about yourself? I'm great, thank you. And then welcome on the show. I am very pleased to see you and I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting interview today. We will be uh, talking about implementing right the tech in the financial services sector and how an increase in uh, the data that are available can be sometimes a detriment instead of help. But before we jump into that, can you please share with our audience and our viewers your professional background and perhaps let us know what you're up to in these days? Yeah, sure. So I've been in financial crime and sanctions for about nine years now. Uh, started out in uh, you know various banks in the United States. And then in the middle of August 2020, I moved, into, I moved to Copenhagen uh, to work for a Nordic bank. And um, recently, uh, back in August of 2022, I started working for a Nordic Paytech company. So slightly different than the, the fin crime sanction space. Now I'm looking into uh, scheme compliance. Uh, just wanted to kind of uh, add to my skill set, set a bit. Um, so that's uh, what I'm doing currently for work. Um, but also on top of that, um, in December of uh, 2022, I um, helped stand up the Association for Certified Financial uh, uh, Crime Specialists uh, Nordic Chapter. Um, so um, that's something that I'm very excited about. I think the Nordic community really needs a uh, uh, lack of better term of community to kind of help and, um, you know, share information and kind of uh, have uh, sparring partners so that we could all learn together and kind of uh, help each other bring up our compliance programs together. Amazing. That's uh, such a wide range of experience and uh, changes also through countries. So um, I look forward to hear your view on, uh, on the questions that I have for you. So let's get right into it and start with the questions that I've prepared. I wanted to ask you, how do you approach the decision making process when it comes to implementing new technology in uh, the financial services sector, or perhaps more particularly in banking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, as you know, uh, budgets are tight everywhere, especially when it comes to tech. I mean, if you go into any financial in institution, I, I feel like you'll get the same answer that the tech is lacking. Um, but I mean, from my perspective, I get excited when I hear about new tech. Uh, the reason being, uh, again, because financial institu institutions are kind of behind in the times you're dealing with, uh, you know, obsolete, um, you know, technology where you kind of have to always put band-aids on it to kind of make it more efficient or have these workarounds or, um, you know, kind of, you know, these ad hoc ways of, of doing things to, to, to get, you know, the uh, right information you need. Um, so <clears throat> when I'm talking, when we're talking about new tech, um, you know, what I feel is super important. And I think it's kind of the times that we're in is that there's a lot more companies out there now that are, um, you know, pushing the old guard as it were to, to make their products better. So you have these new fintechs that are coming up, uh, throughout the world, especially here in the Nordics, uh, where. You know they're taking old problems like uh, kyc management or aml or just um you know uh, data kind of um, synthesizing software and they're they're working with the community itself to kind of figure out the best ways of doing things and that's something that i feel is is new because the old guard just kind of just says hey i'm the big player here this is what i could give you you take it or leave it and that's what it was for so long and now I feel like you're starting to see a shift that these old companies are feeling the pressure from the new companies and now they're starting to adapt and and 
you know make their new uh, i guess updates to their so to their product a bit more regularly um and adopting ai and machine learning and all these you know kind of catchphrases uh to kind of make life a bit easier so you know when when i've had demos or you know sent out rfps for whatever it was uh whether it's new tech or data um it's just very intriguing to see the now the variance of what's available and kind of the um adaptability that these companies are now employing instead of just giving you that cookie cutter approach thank you so much and what are uh, some key factors that you consider when uh, choosing the right technology in the financial services for an organization yeah i think that that depends largely on the type of business you're doing and the jurisdictions you operate in um i think that that kind of mandates or kind of helps you uh prioritize what companies to look at because while you know they're great companies out of the US sometimes they're just US centric um and now so now with the kind of uh GDPR issues that EU has with the US uh we have to be careful with uh when it comes to data <clears throat> so you know again i think it's uh, you know you have to take a holistic approach to it and uh see not only if that that a uh, tech provider can or possibly could give you what you need but also um understand where their data is coming from uh the governance behind it and um it, it aligns with the needs of of your customers and the jurisdictions you operate in yeah you mentioned there the data element which is of course key as part of the technology discussion we are having so perhaps uh, are you able to share an example when an increase in data that uh, are, were actually available was more of an indifference of a problem rather than helping uh, the process yeah i mean i think there's many examples of this um you know because now again that technology has gotten so much better uh, the availability availability of data has grown exponentially um but now the issue is now you're drowning in data if you don't have a trusted uh, partner that could help you uh, synthesize that information and be able to focus on you know what the key risks might be um so um an, a, a specific example of this i think uh you know if i have to kind of um think of something really quickly off the top of my head is you know the the Dow Jones offering of Factiva I don't know if you have, if you're familiar with it but if you plug something in it just gives you a, a plethora of of uh reports and articles and you're like whoa what is this so now you have to figure out do I have to read all of these do I have to somehow have to prioritize it right that could be you know a painstaking uh exercise uh but then you know you have other providers out there um plugs into different data sources but then can kind of highlight based on how your how you set it up could kind of flag certain things to you so that you could you could uh, focus on and yeah. that's something that i you know when i talk to tech companies i constantly um kind of raise to them it's like okay it's it's one thing to be able to um you know it, it's kind of shifted right before it was like oh we need tech to give us data or red flags right now that's happening but since it's still um in the dating analyst it's like okay let's take it a step further how can we use the technology um you know the data ai ma machine learning to kind of help us focus on what we really we, what we really need to focus on right so based on whether what if whether it's our criteria or the tech company comes up with some sort of criteria or keywords help it help us to say okay well these other things it's kind of white noise let's push that aside for whatever reason and let's look at really drill down and look at what's in front of us um and you know if you look in you know I, right now i'm sitting in the eu but talking about a us example like ofac they always use the term of reasonable due diligence right um that's such a vague term right what does reasonable due diligence mean does that mean that you do a google search and you look through just the first few hits or is that does that mean that you have to do a bit more so i think uh it all depends on the risk tolerance of the company and they really need to and this is hard to say because when you talk about operational uh tasks in the first line doing these reviews they love checklists right because they just say tell me what to do 
how long to do it and we'll repeat that task um but that's a problem there's a problem with that because then what happens is then they become blinded to maybe other red flag or you know they don't follow their gut instinct to keep reading because i said oh no i could check the box then i'm done and i'm moving on because you know they're looking at how much time i spend on an alert to keep moving so being too prescriptive is also um you know a danger in, in this field um but you know uh, you know we're talking about how to, how to use tech effectively i think it all comes down to the bottom line of operational effectiveness right so i think as you know we the users uh get better at this we need to communicate with our vendor partners um and that that um you know um uh, relationship could then you know hopefully reveal the the fruits of the the labor that we're doing amazing and i just want to stay a bit longer on the data point because uh, i think this is something that um is quite central to to the discussion and The, the balance, I think, is a key element here. So how do you balance the need for more data with the potential risk and the challenges of managing and analyzing large amounts of data? You know, it's not so much about getting the information anymore. It's about having help understanding the information. And, you know, there could be many ways to do that. You know, with keyword searches, with, um, you know, just the system being able to to understand the type of searches you do and then kind of, kind of highlight what you're looking for so it could be a, a, a you know a plethora of things and <clears throat> there's one thing to understand is that there's no silver bullet right there's no uh, at least right now there's no kind of perfect solution out there um so i think it takes a, a bit of uh you know usage of different tools to come up with an accurate assessment Um, not to say that we need so much of redund redundancy and similar types of uh, data, but, you know, just like if you're reading about a topic, you can't trust the first source. You need to have corroborating information. So I think that has to be uh, taken into account. Um, and yeah, also, you know, just the ability for tech to learn how to reduce the, the noise out there and cut down on a lot of the, you know, the, the mundane uh, or the, you know, what they call uh, false matches, right? Because again, uh, kind of like a tick the box ex exercise, you know, you have analysts doing these first level reviews and they're just, sometimes they get into a mode of, oh, this is fine, this is fine. And they release, 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 release. And then something. Um, so I think what happened, look, um, you know, more sophisticated in a way, not as far as, you know, how the, the data is being pulled in but just being able to teach the tech to what to look for um and then the also kind of part of it is the training component right we need to make sure that analysts are aware of not only how to do it but why they're doing it the what you know the what and the why because once they know the importance of what they're doing there's more buy-in and they're more diligent instead of just again oh you know this is fine this is nothing you know um what i do doesn't matter uh you know i'm just going through no. this because i have to but they'll take more time to really concentrate on it if they know the impact it has down the road and the, in your experience what are some common pitfalls that organization face when implementing the new technology <laughs> yeah that's a good one um yeah i think uh A, a common issue is bad data. You'll hear mm. that, I think, across the board, right? Bad data in, bad data out is a saying. Uh, so no matter what tool you have, even if it's top of the line, fresh off, you know, freshly being built, um, if you have bad data, it doesn't matter what you're using. <laughs> even if, you know, if you're going from a spreadsheet to like the top of the line tech, um, bad data is going to ruin your, you, you, you right then and there. So I think, you know, we have to uh, pay more attention to that, finally. I mean, I've, there's been a lot of issues with KYC and, and the onboarding process, but I think that, you know, there has to be more done around that as far as doing it correctly, um, you know, doing it more efficiently. 
um, you know, there's a lot of tech companies now t- talking about perpetual KYC instead of, you know, the, you know, moment in time KYC that's kind of happening at the moment. And I think, you know, when, with the right technology, you can do that constant, um, uh, you know, reviewing of KYC. You know, it's done to a certain extent now with list manage. You know, with list uh, screening when it comes to sanctions. But I think more has to be done to stay on top of that. Um, another another thing I like to raise is kind of uh, what I've noticed. You know, throughout the different banks I work for, is that when they're trying to implement new tech, whether it's purchasing it from a third party or uh, creating it in house, is that they're looking to build it for their problem today not realizing that by the time they finish building it out it's already going to be obsolete because their problems have changed right it does you can't build something from a moment in time um i guess to elaborate on that more is you know obviously you need something to help you today but you also have to be a bit forward thinking to say okay this is what i need today but what else can we think of that we would need going forward you know, co- collaborating with the other stakeholders more so that you are taking into account their needs and their future needs. Um, and, and something that I've heard from a ton of vendors, uh, and I kind of mentioned it earlier is, you know, it's more of a relationship that we need with them. So instead of going to a vendor and saying, I need, you know, this paper clip, you could say, well, I need something to hold papers together. How do you suppose I do that? Right? Because now you're giving them more leeway to kind of really figure out how to assess your problem and come to come to a, a good product instead of just saying i need this one thing um so that takes time and that takes uh, you know trust because what happens is you, you know the businesses are thinking oh the vendors just want money the vendors are saying i want to help you so there's a lot of you know friction uh, between that and i think you know what you see also is that people rely on uh, I forgot the, the 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 company that comes out with these stats, but you know they rate, um, you know the companies that are um, you know doing good in you know let's say in KYC or sanctions, and they show you the big players and you know the other companies and how they rate in efficiency or I don't know what really they're rating there because it's <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. But just because you know a company rates high on that list doesn't mean they're the best vendor for you. Um, so I think people should be more pragmatic about it and say, okay, you know, what do I need? And look at the old players, the new players, and then kind of figure out who suits their needs best um, instead of just relying on the biggest name. Because as we know, name brands doesn't mean it's actually a better product. Um, and the last point I'll make on that is, um, you know, uh, and I kind of, you know, alluded to it a bit earlier is that we have to be clear about involving the different stakeholders who are going to be involved in the process. Because, you know, if I was, you know, when I was back at Danske Bank and, you know, representing, you know, the sanctions team when it comes to controls and technology, right, my view is predominantly on sanctions. But if I just worry about sanctions, but this product is supposed to help the other parts of FinCrime, they're going to be gaps, right? So it's it's being able to communicate with your partners around FinCrime to say, hey, I'm trying to get this tool. Maybe you already have something you're using that I could utilize. Or I'm trying to get this tool. I have the budget for it. What are your, some of your needs? Because you might need to use this too. So I, I think a lot of it is communication. Can you talk about the role of training and education now in uh, ensuring that your team is able to effectively use new technology in the financial services? Yeah, uh, training is is super, super important. I can't stress that enough. I think that some of the pitfalls we fall, fall into is that assuming that everybody is at the same knowledge level or same playing field. Um, and that's not always the case. So I think, you know, we have to take that into account when we're looking into training and education um, in general, right? And and there's ways that you could um, also uh, look to kind of have um, kind of precise training to the people who need it, right? You send out questionnaires or something and say, okay, well, you know, they need this type of training, but they're at a higher level. So maybe we'll just tailor it to, to that 
subset and then the ones who need more well uh, more over overall kind of training we're going to tailor something to them um and i think that's more appropriate right because what happens is you know training is another tick the box ex exercise uh, a lot of times when you see it um where you get a yearly kind of email, oh, you have to do conduct, code and conduct, or you have to do GDPR, and then you're just flicking through it. Oh, okay, I gotta get just just get this over with. So people are not really learning. Um, so I think when you're starting to tailor the appropriate training to the appropriate um, members, then you get more attention and they're really um, absorbing that information. And when it comes to new tech, it's the same thing. I think, um, you know, people, uh, are always afraid of change in the beginning. There's always, a, 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 I guess, a human instinct to kind of reject change, right? Because you get comfortable in what you're doing, even though you might hate the tool, you hate how it works, the data you're getting sucks, the, the news you're getting out of it, it's horrible. But I, could, I introduce something new to you. Oh, I don't want to do it because it's different, it's difficult. Um, so I think, you know, getting over that hurdle and teaching them the tool, making sure they're comfortable with it, with it, working with the vendor for uh, live trainings um, or, you know, uh, recorded trainings, I think is, is super essential. The last point I want to make regarding training education is that, um, you know, it's important to, to, to keep, in t uh, you know, your finger on the pulse of your team. Um, always asking them, you know, if there's anything else that they need or that they're uncomfortable with that you can help kind of coach and mentor them. And, um, you know, I, I find I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So I find a lot of interesting articles uh, that are shared um, tips, um, even including from you, Marco. So I think, you know, also, you know, if you are in that position to kind of, um, you know, either be part of training or you're helping your team kind of be more comfortable um, with what they're doing, uh, utilizing uh, that platform uh, to, to, to find, you know, relevant, uh, more relevant information and articles to share with your team, I think would be super helpful. Yeah, I agree with you. It's a phenomenal platform. I think uh, it's increased so much uh, the use of, of LinkedIn throughout the professional network uh, in the last few years. And I find it super useful myself. And probably already know the answer to that, but maybe a part of it. But how do you stay up to date on the latest technology trends and development uh, in your field? Yeah, that was a good segue. <laughs> so yeah, definitely uh, LinkedIn I, to me is the go-to. Um, as I mentioned, I'm quite active on there and, and I think for good reason because, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there. Again, it um, depends on what you're looking for, but, you know, in our profession, I think that um, you get a lot of information regarding, um, you know, a lot of the changes that's happening, uh, you know, around the world, uh, geopolitical issues, you also get more information on technology, um, and you can have nice open conversations there um, that could lead to setting up demos and stuff like that. So um, I think that's definitely my go to. I mean, def um, there's, you know, there's also the fact of, you know, reaching out to, to your own personal network that you have. Um, you know, as mentioned before, when you're in compliance, it's a small world. <laughs> you could travel across the world and still, uh, you know, cross paths with somebody that you've worked with before, or you've, um, you know, seen them talk on a webinar. So it's 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 um, super interesting how that happens. But um, yeah, you could utilize your either your own personal network or, or LinkedIn. I think are are very, um, you know, um, the good ways to kind of yeah. keep your finger on the pulse and and be able to, you know. Uh, delve into different things if you like. Yeah, often on my channel, people are asking me about the um, possibility to get jobs and uh, roles in like career tips and so on. So would you be able, uh, in your opinion, to share what are uh, some key qualities, perhaps that a successful candidate that are applying for technology implementation role should have? Yeah, I mean, I think that's tricky, right? Because I think if a lot of those specs that they when they're first written out, it sounds like they want somebody who's super uh, tech heavy, um, that they know how to program or they know how to, you know, synth synthesize information really quickly, you know, using S SQL or Python. And, you know, I, I don't fit that mold. I mean, I, I would say that I'm, I'm quite efficient using, you know, technology, but when it comes to coding or stuff like that, I have no idea how that works, um, 
but I guess, you know, the angle that I come with is that I've been in the field for a while. I've worked in both first and second levels, um, done operation and more strategic work. So when it comes to tech, yeah, I can program it, but my conversations between, you know, my stakeholders or the technology team, I'm able to bridge that gap a bit efficiently. Um, so, so yeah, anybody looking to kind of, um, leave you know the more operational side or maybe the more strategic side and kind of maybe find a home in the tech side i think that um yeah it's a bit of luck <laughs> because you, you need the, the opportunity to present itself um but as long as i think if you know i by nature i talk in very layman's terms so i think that's why it's also easy for me to kind of translate what we would need to the tech team to say hey this is how we want to see it or how we want it to work um but others you know sometimes you get stuck in the you know the jargon right the, you talk too much compliance talk or you too, talk too much tech talk and then there's some confusion um uh, but yeah i think you know it's just about keeping an open mind um a generally understanding risk, right? Um, I mean, obviously, if it's in your specific, you know, concentration, like I've been in sanctions for so long, I understand sanctions risk a lot, but I understand other parts of financial crime risk. So I think, um, you know, we're dealing with a lot of gray area. So uh, tech won't completely erase that. So I think that's, you know, it takes, um, you know, experience to kind of figure out how to how to you know work Trans within the tech and and you know get at least as close to where you need to get and then the human could take over you have one last question for you which i wanted to find out which is if we look at uh, to the future what do you see as the biggest opportunities and uh, challenges as well in terms of implementing the right technology for uh, for an organization Yeah, I think, you know, you, you could run into a, uh, a few things. I mean, the first thing I, I kind of uh, alluded to earlier was, you know, being afraid of new vendors where you just rely solely on the big players in the field. Um, I think that, you know, again, you have to look at the bigger picture, um, you know, see exactly what you need from a vendor and then, you know, see what aligns with that and your budget. Um, You know, and then you could build the appropriate business case to kind of get the the, the help that you need from the tech side. Um, and I think now, you know, the biggest opportunity we have is that, you know, maybe over the last few months, the fintech field has taken a hit um, because of the cryptocurrency uh, issues and inflation and all this other stuff that's going on. But um, I think, you know, what we've been lucky to have, at least leading up to now, and I hope it continues, is that you know, more fintechs are popping up every day and they're looking at the issues that need to be solved, right? They're trying to fill the gaps. And um, as long as we're, we're have an open mind to that, as far as, you know, the, the consumer and we try to work with these vendors, I think it would only make um, uh, the tech going forward uh, better for everyone, right? That's um, so we have to, be able to share and be open to talk to the vendors and um and you know like i mentioned before the new these new companies are happy and willing to talk to to the to the community because they want to um be able to give you a product that's what you need that's sustainable and all that good stuff so um yeah so i mean about open-mindedness and and uh yeah i think you know to go back to what i said before it's um you know i think you know, going forward, obviously there's going to, you know, if we look at the financial crime picture, 2023, you know, we're still dealing with the, the Russia Ukraine war. Uh, what new sanctions are going to happen? Who knows? Um, you know, you still think you're still working on uh, issues with cyber crime, uh, you know, so AML issues. So you still have a lot of the old issues, right? That hasn't gone away, but as far as the new issues, um, you know, the cyber crimes and, that being related to sanctions that a lot of people don't realize, right? OFAC wants you to report if you suffer from a ransomware attack because they want to uh, investigate it and sanction them. Um, but yeah, to me, I, I would say, you know, uh, to stick fundamentally, KYC is still the name of the game. We have to get that data right. We have to be able to efficiently, um, you know, onboard clients and do our reviews so that we can, um, you know, mitigate that potential risk that's there. Um, and 
that's the first point of entry uh, when it sort comes to a financial institution. So I think we need to get that right. Um, and also sanctions is a for, first for sanctions screening is the first point of entry to the financial industry, right? So um, that's also why we need tech to be good, right? We want to eliminate some you know, more false positives, focus on the risk. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, that's kind of my, uh, my, you know, my stake to the 2023 and onward is uh, we got to get better at certain things and just yeah. be more open-minded to the tech that's out there. Thank you. Thanks. That was amazing. Uh, lastly, if viewers are keen to get in touch with you, Louis, what's the best way to contact you? Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So um, there's a few Louis Vargas's out there, but not many with this face <laughs> and in Copenhagen. So yeah. um, even though I'm a New Yorker born and raised, uh, I'm in Copenhagen now. So I think if you look me up, it's, it'll yeah. be pretty easy to find me. So yeah, happy to hear from anybody who wants to connect, um, share their insights. If I got anything wrong, please let me know. I'm open to that too. And um, yeah, it, it was really great speaking to you, Mark. Amazing. I will leave a um, link to your LinkedIn profile then in the description of this video. And I want to thank you for accepting to speak on my channel. It was uh, a true pleasure to host you today and hope we can chat again in the near future with uh, some more insights as well from the industry you're working in and all updates. So thanks one more time and I wish you a good day. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Marco. You too. It was an honor to, to be on your channel and I definitely hope to be a part of it again. We are now at the end of this Q&A video focused on technology in the financial services. If my content were useful to you, press the thumb up and leave me your feedback using the comment down below of this video. I'm also pleased to let you know that if you want to send a super thanks for the work that you do, you can now do so directly from this YouTube video. And lastly, Thank you for watching, hope you have enjoyed today's video and until next time, see you soon.